All right, I'll start at chapter <clears throat> 3, verse 21. A couple weeks ago, you remember, we ended at verse 20, where Paul talked about just the, the, the evil in our hearts and, and really, <coughs> pardon me, how bad we are. Well, 21, he picks up. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Paul says, apart from the law, there is another kind of righteousness which you can have, which the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, have always spoken about. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Would you read verse 23 out loud? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation, and I'll mention what that is later, in his demonstration, pardon me, in his, in his blood through faith, which was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier. Would you say just and the justifier? Just and the justifier. So God would be just and he would be the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now let's turn to our discussion guide. There are realities within God's own heart, ingredients in his eternal nature, which cannot be ignored or changed even by him. Sometimes people have it in their head that, that God can just do whatever God wants to do. I mean, he's the man. He gets, he, he, so he can just make up rules as he goes. It's not true. There, God is a person, and God is in his person is, among other things, totally just. And there, there just is simply such a thing as what is just and what is not just. Remember Abraham, uh, as uh, he was appealing to, to, it says Yahweh, he was appealing to Yahweh. The Lord showed up, physical form, it was the pre-incarnate Jesus, in his camp with two angels. Remember that? Sarah served him dinner. By the way, it was a non-kosher dinner. Uh, Serves him dinner. And afterwards, the Lord said, shall I, shall I reveal to Abraham what I'm about to do? And then he says, Abraham, I'm about to fricassee Sodom. That's fricassee, by the way, people sometimes wonder. <laughs> it, it means to, what do you, cook by flame. It's when you flame a thing. You know, give fricassee or, oh, never mind. <laughs> All right, but you got the picture. So he says, I am going to basically fricassee uh, Sodom. And well, Lot, Abram's uh, nephew, lives there. And the, the dialogue that takes place is really telling. Abraham says to, to Yahweh, he says, Surely the judge of the, all the earth will not do unrighteously. You would never punish the righteous with the wicked. He is appealing to fundamental justice. He's saying it's wrong for you to, 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 to kill righteous people and punish them for, wicked, for the wicked. And, 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 the, and the Lord doesn't say, hey, back off, big guy. I'm God. I do what I want. He doesn't go there. He says, you're right. I won't do unjustly. Notice that? God himself is bound by justice. There's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. And God himself acknowledges that. So if he's going to forgive our sins, if he's going to suddenly say, I'm going to give you the gift of righteousness just because you've repented and believed, what happens to the justice to all of our sin? That's the question Paul is raising in this passage. Is it just for him to simply Mercifully, forgive us. Can he do that? Back to our text. They are essential elements of who he is, and who he is forms the foundation of all creation of his spiritual and the physical worlds. Justice and love are both completely true of God. 
but love is his, is his dominant trait. Somebody say, thank heavens. <laughs> Above all else, he loves. This is why we exist. This is why he has given us freedom. This is why he has made the ultimate personal sacrifice to rescue us from our misuse of that freedom. He is the rock upon which all of the universe rests. He defines what is good and bad, right and wrong, clean and unclean, beautiful and ugly, and he never changes, nor does he violate himself. In the passage before us, Paul wants us to see that in order to save us, God did not violate his own justice. He is able to give the gift of righteousness to those who have faith, not because he is morally indifferent to our sins, but because someone else paid our penalty. The cruel demands of justice, which show no mercy, there's no mercy in true justice, have been met. Today, we will look into the heart of God and see there some frightening realities and a depth of love beyond our comprehension. Let's start at Romans 2, verse 4. Talking to the self-righteous religious person, but to all of us, he says, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to what? Repentance. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath. Would you say wrath? Yeah. Wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance and doing good, and he's not just talking about walking an old lady across the street, he's talking here about walking in faith, pursuing God for, and, and loving eternal things, for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But those who are selfishly ambitious, is what mine says, have the attitude of a day laborer. I want to be paid here and now in this life. Don't, uh, don't talk to me about heaven. I want my pleasure, my fulfillment here on this planet. To those who are like that and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, that would be the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Let me ask this. Have you ever wondered why God puts up with some people? <laughs> Do not look right or left. <clears throat> We've all known or known of individuals who are especially cruel and selfish, defiant rebels who either don't believe in God or do believe but have no intention of changing their ways. Their lives are strewn with people they've injured, and sooner or later we may wonder to ourselves, why doesn't God stop this? Why does he sit back and let this continue? Paul's answer here may surprise and even shock us. He says God is patient with sinners for a reason, a terrible reason, and I just read it. What did you hear through all of that language, all of that he was saying? He talked about the wrath of God. He talked about the judgment of God, indignation, persecution, tribulation for every soul who sins. There is no getting around that fact. Until we come to grips with what he's talking about, we don't understand the gospel. Why would he send his son? Why would the cross be there? Why would he do what he did? Why is this of such urgency? If you take this piece out of the puzzle, it all comes apart. If you put this piece back into the puzzle, it all makes sense. Let me just reflect for a minute on what he's talking about, in my opinion. To those who won't repent, God gives absolute justice. See, that's what you get if, if, if you don't repent. If we've chosen to live apart from him here on earth, once we die, that decision becomes permanent. You've got to get a hold of that fact. There is nothing in Scripture whatsoever. In fact, everything in Scripture, absolutely all of it, says once you're on the other side, you can't change, you can't repent. You are in that condition forever. Amen. That's the awful truth. When people die, they die like that. And will be like that forever. We will enter eternity unchanged. 
carrying our sin with us, full of darkness while immersed in the fire of his glory. I believe that when you talk about the lake of fire, as I looked at it in Revelations, we went through that, I'm convinced the lake of fire is the Shekinah fire of God. We will all live in it. But imagine living in it separated from God, still full of your lusts, your fears, your anger, unchanged with all of that, separated from God, living in that presence miserably. Now, he's not... There... I do not believe, and I don't think the scripture actually, as I study it hard, I'm convinced, it's not saying God made some kind of barbecue pit. He resurrected people and then burns them alive forever. That is a grotesque concept. It is the most appallingly awful, horrible concept of anything in religion. I mean, if it's true, it is. And then you turn around and say, by the way, God is love. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, if he weren't, what would he do to us? Burning someone alive forever, there, there is nothing else I think humans can conceive of that's worse. That's it. We're at, the, we're at the end. We can't think of a more awful torture. It is unconscionable. But I think what it says is that he gives us absolute justice. He, we, we go hurtling into eternity with the misery we've created for ourselves one choice at a time. The more we sin, the more we damage ourselves. The more we damage ourselves, the more we suffer in eternity. This is, the, is perfect justice. People unable to repent, enduring forever the fear, depression, anger, lust, hatred that they invited into their own hearts one choice at a time. This is why Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you watched people as they get older and older? Some get really sweet. And some get really mean. Now imagine crossing the line. Mean. Angry. Depressed. Hateful. You've passed over. But your spirit hasn't changed a bit. And you now can never change. That's hell. God hasn't done anything to you, but give you what you wanted. You didn't want him. You pushed him away time and again. And so he has ratified your decision. I mean, death has ratified your decision. You now are caught in that, like that, forever. It's a terrible thought, isn't it? Now, God thinks so too. And God looks at that. And his love and his longing for every one of us says, I cannot bear that to happen. I will do everything in my power to rescue you. When you put that into the equation, you begin to understand the love of God. You begin to understand the cross. You begin to understand why would he send his son? This isn't a game. This is a desperate attempt to rescue us from what we've created. The horror of this eternal reality is so great that God puts up with enormous provocation. Why does he put up? You see, sometimes you say, why do good people seem to die and then these awful people seem to have nine lives? Why do you think? God's just keeping them going. I had one fellow say to me just the other day, he said, my brother's been near death five times and he says he won't receive Christ. But he, but he's, he says, I'm going back there now. He's dying. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share Christ with him. Why do you think he keeps getting prolonged? God's mercy has given that guy another chance. That stubborn old bird. Because he loves him. And he can hardly bear the thought that he will perish and suffer like that. If given, this just, if given justice... Paul says there in, 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 in Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If given justice, the justice we deserve, every human will end up in that eternal torment. We all deserve to go there. Somebody say, uh. Thank you. Verse 24. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. God is not able to simply ignore our sins. 
he must be just. But he is also loving because, and because of his love, he has found a righteous way to justify us. Here are some of the eternal spiritual principles that have allowed him to satisfy justice, yet at the same time rescue people from the demands of justice. First of all, moral guilt can be transferred from one person to another. In other words, it's possible for someone to be punished for someone else's sin. Where, does that, where do you see that in the Bible? The sacrificial system. What was that all about? Beginning with Seth, Adam's son. They lay hands on the sacrifice and confess their sins. And then <laughs> cut the throat of the poor thing. And it would die in their place. Now, no one thought that I think animals somehow could atone for you. But what was the message? What's the symbol? What's going on here? Why did God ask this of them? Why did, why did Abel do it and, and, and Cain did not? And, and God accepted Abel's sacrifice and he didn't accept Cain's. What was the deal? One is an appeal for repentance and an appeal for mercy. And God's teaching humans from the very first humans, you can transfer sin. It will transfer but a person's sin can only be transferred to another human. Animal sacrifices in the Bible were only met as teaching tools and a focus of faith, not a moral equivalent. Hebrews says it. The blood of bulls and goats will not atone for sin. David says it. I give you the psalm reference there. David says it. He says, I know perfectly well that all these, the blood of these animals isn't what's going to do this thing. They weren't fooled. They knew that. It was a symbol. That human, if we're going, it's going to be transferred to a human. It has to be one righteous will receiving the sin of an unrighteous will. A human, one human for another. That human will have to be sinless. And no one is. And that human must be willing. You can't tie them up and throw them into the volcano kind of thing. You, the, 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 the substitution must be a freely chosen gift. The will must be giving itself, himself or herself for the for the unrighteous. Not a compulsion. The moral value of the payment must meet or exceed the moral value of the sin. Simple justice. If we're going to pay for the sin of the world, then whatever's put on this side of the scale, the sacrifice, the atonement made, will have to be of a moral equivalent for the sin of the entire human race. That's a problem. How could the death of one human, even a perfect human, atone for the sin of the whole world? It doesn't make sense. In order to pay for the sin of the whole world, God would have to die. For God to die, he would have to become a mortal man. To be sinless, he would have to be tempted. To be willing, he would have to be offered an escape. We've just told the gospel. For, for God to die, he would have to become a mortal man. That's the incarnation. That's Christmas. That's what the whole story is about. He made that choice. To be sinless, he would have to be tempted. In the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord, after serving communion to his disciples, went across the Kidron to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happened there? He was waiting for the soldiers to come and arrest him. And he was praying, and he said, Oh, God, may this cup pass from me. And then, as the Father said, it, You must do it. What did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And so he went into an anxiety attack, I think, a severe one. He'd read the Bible. He knew exactly. He'd read Psalm 22. He'd read Isaiah 53. He knew what they were going to do to him. He knew who he was. And he sat there suffering like this, knowing they're going to tear him to pieces, waiting for them to come and arrest him. 
And he would have to be offered a, an escape. He was offered that. Now, look at verse 25 of Romans 3. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood. Through him, through faith. God must be just. His love cannot violate his justice. Even he has to play by the rules. But his love can righteously provide a way of escape for those he loves. If and only if he or his son is willing to die in our place. Such love goes beyond human comprehension. In fact... In my opinion, not even the devil understood what was taking place on the cross. And that's why he willingly encouraged the sac a crucifixion which resulted in the salvation of billions. Have you ever wondered, why was he so stupid? Is to, just to assist that thing, he was, he was assisting his own demise. Very simple. The devil could not conceive that God would do that. Why? Such selfless love simply never occurred to him. And it is, and as Paul will argue here, I'll show you later, it, 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 never, it, it isn't human either. We just wouldn't do this, not for wicked people. Jesus is the center point of history. Those who lived before the cross received the righteousness of faith made possible by the cross. When they believed in him who justifies the ungodly, when someone like Abraham or David called on God for mercy, he was able to righteously forgive their sins because he looked forward in time and saw the cross. You see that? When David had, kills Uriah and he sleeps with his wife and does all of this and calls on God for mercy, he's given it. God doesn't just say, oh, I'm going to just forget what you did to Uriah. I'm going to forget what you did to Bathsheba. No big deal. I like you. That isn't what happened. God said, I will grant you mercy. Because as I look forward in time, I know my son will die for you. See, the cross is the center point of history. Now we, today, we're going to take the symbols of that cross, the bread and the, and the cup. When you and I confess our sins today, he doesn't just say, oh, I like you, I'll just, I'll just forget it. No. He, he says, I will give you mercy because my son has died for you. You see it? Since the cross, we have a much clearer picture. We know the name of his son and what was done for him. And when we call on him for mercy, God looks backward and sees the cross and is able to righteously forgive our sins. Now, go with me, if you will, to Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, again, this whole argument just continues on. It's all part of a whole. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. If we grasp the depth of God's love for us, we will never doubt his commitment to save us. Paul says we can be certain, that's the word exalt, we can boast, that we have been rescued from God's wrath and will live forever in his glory. He points to two indisputable proofs of this fact. He says, first of all, he says, how can you know how can you be sure that your hope for eternal life is sound? That, that you really will, when you get to the judgment, escape his wrath? How can you know that? And Paul says there's two proofs. First of all, verse 5, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. First of all, Paul says, listen to your heart. The Holy Spirit who dwells in you is telling you how much God loves you. Have you heard that voice? Have you noticed how Christians, I mean, real born-again ones, have this certainty about them? It, it, from the outside, I think it looks smug. Like, you Christians, you're so conceited. That may be so, but... 
But that's not why we're, we're so confident. We're confident because there's, there's a voice inside telling us we're loved. Even in some of our most awful moments, some of our worst failures, we sit there despondent and angry at ourselves. And there's this voice inside saying, I love you. Right? Paul says, when you have the Spirit of God in you, he's in there crying, Abba, Father. He's in there saying, I love you, child. That voice is inside us. Second thing Paul says, it is proof that we can be sure that we will not face the wrath of God. He says, verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul says, not only listen to your heart, he says, look at what God was willing to do for you while you were still his enemies. He loved you at a level of personal sacrifice beyond human comprehension. We could understand someone dying for a good person. We might understand a parent dying for a child. But nobody dies for a wicked person. Nobody does that. And Paul says, can you see that while we, you, individually, as well as corporately, were helpless, in other words, trapped by the powers of sin and temptation, sinning away, while we were enemies of God, independent and rebellious, he loved us when we were like that so much that he himself, through his son, was willing to die for us. He says, do you get it? Do you see? When Paul earlier had said that Jesus is our propitiation, he says, you, you know what the propitiation is? In the, the, the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement would go into the Holy of Holies. It's the only time. First of all, he was to, to burn a good deal of incense. The thing was to be full of this sweet-smelling smoke. And then he would go beyond that curtain. It was the only time. And he'd have a bowl of blood. He'd, they'd, they'd sacrifice the bowl. And then he would take and he would sprinkle seven times blood on the mercy seat, which is a go, that gold plate on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And on the ground, seven times he would sprinkle this blood, appealing on behalf of the nation for the mercy of God, based on blood. The word in Greek, in the Greek, the Greek Bible, the Greek Septuagint, for that mercy seat is the propitiatory. This is the propitiation, the appeal in blood before a, and that higher people for mercy. And God said, Paul says, that God in Christ, as he hung him on the cross for the world to look at, was appealing, to, was, was sprinkling us, that he was, his blood was appealing and and fulfilling the demands of justice. God said, look, I'm not unjust. Look what I've done. As I took the, my wrath, as I took the justice, do all of you, and I let my son bear it. Paul says, if he'll do that for you, now that you are his friends, not his enemies, now that through faith and repentance you have become his friends, what would the living Christ do for you? And where is the living Christ right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. And what's he doing there? Come on. He's interceding for you. 
So when you were his enemies, he sent his son to die for you. Now that you are his friends, his son at the right hand of the father is interceding for you constantly, appealing to his atonement on your behalf. He says, do you see it? It's impossible that if you remain in faith in Christ that you will not go to heaven, that you are not loved now, that your sins are not washed away. Don't you see the depth of God's love? Isn't it, don't we revert back to our own love? We assume God's like us. Small, petty, impatient. We run, out of, we run out of love very quickly. Don't we? And we assume he does too. God isn't like us. He's in, virtually incomprehensible. His love is at a depth and a power that is beyond what we understand. And it's why we will go to heaven. This gift of income. Oh, I was said I was going to show you one more passage. And I'm going to be wild and crazy and just take a sec. Go with me to Romans 8. Listen to this. In light of what you've just heard. Tell me this doesn't make sense. Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, here we are, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? If he'll give you his son, if he loves you like that, what would he withhold from you? Next time you beg him for something in prayer. Next time you beg him for mercy, it's fine to confess your sin and, that, and thank the Lord and for his grace and mercy. But when you start begging for it, you, you've missed something. Something's missing in the wiring. You don't see it. He's already given you mercy beyond words. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised who is at the right hand of God, who also does what? There it is. That's the living Christ. Now that he's alive, what is he doing? He's interceding for us. Then Paul says with that, who will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Who can take us away from that love? Now, I must remain in faith, but with that assumption, which I'm going to do, so are you, there is no power in heaven and earth, there is no power in hell that can take me away from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. My eternal life, my, my announcing of, of being innocent and, and, and forgiven at the judgment is absolutely certain. So I can now boast that I am saved. I can boast that I am on my way to heaven. I don't have to wonder about it. I can boast and exult in it now. It's mine now because what's been done is solid as a rock. You follow? Let's, let's ask this question and we'll close. This gift of incomparable love is given to those who receive it by faith. And faith is a choice. If we will, you and I can choose to believe God's word. Would you bow your heads with me just one moment? Paul's gospel is clear. It's, it's, as, it's as sharp as a knife. How could he say any more strongly that God is able to look right straight at your sin and mine, to look at the ugly things in our lives, to look at the rebellion, and yet love us? How could he say more clearly that what Christ has done is enough to pay for my sin and for yours? I just want to ask this question before we take communion. Is there anyone today, I think it particularly applies to this person who says, I have done something too awful. I have done something so often. I have so disappointed myself. I am so weak in the face of temptation. I am so 
foolish that God's, God is disgusted with me. He, he doesn't want someone like me. And you in your own self-loathing have, have just stopped hoping. You've lost a sense of his love for you. You, at best, can only hope that he will tolerate you. But the idea that he actually loves you with this kind of love, that he would do what we've described, not just for the sin of the world, but he would have done this for you individually. If you were the only person alive, he would have done this for you. That kind of love just hasn't, has gotten lost somewhere and forgotten or, or so covered over with guilt that it's, it's smothered. And you need, to conf you need to say today, I hear you, Father. I hear your love for me while I am an enemy of yours, while I am in my worst condition, while I am weak in the face of sin. You sent your son to die for me. You had no illusions about how strong or good I was. In fact, you said my heart is deceitfully wicked. And yet you loved me and sent your son for me. This day, I choose. Hear that? I choose to believe the word. I choose to trust that the word of God is true in spite of what I feel, in spite of the thoughts that go through my mind. I am going to stand and base my trust on what the word of God says, that I am loved and I am forgiven through Christ Jesus, and that I am going to cling to his cross and I will not let go. Anyone need to raise a hand right now and say, I'm making that choice. I'm confessing that today. In the face of whatever's gone through my head, I am confessing Jesus Christ. Would you hold your hand up? That's you. Just confess. Yes. Yes. Praise God. Yes. 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 Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. This is important. Yes. This is not a game right now. This is no little game at the end of a sermon. This is, this is how, in moments like this, yes, young man, this is how decisions are made in the preaching of the word and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, you responding by faith, choosing to believe what the word of God has said. God will clean you up. God will take care of the matters. God will handle your life. That's another matter altogether. But you, with your will, are saying, I believe. I choose this day. I will stand on the word of God. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus, right now for the word of God just cutting into our hearts and doing its mighty work. Yes, yes, thank you, Savior. Blessed be the Lord, our Savior. Yes. Oh, come Holy Spirit. All right, I'm just, just I'm gonna just ask once more if anybody's holding out. And you would just say, no, I trust him. And you need to raise your hand. I'm going to give you one more opportunity to just respond. Yes, praise God. Thank you, Lord. All right, church, let's pray. Yes, I saw that hand as well. Father God, would you say it after me? Father God, your love for me is amazing. I don't see why. You know my heart, my rebellion, my weakness in the face of temptation. You know me, and yet you love me. While I'm your enemy, you would, you would love me so much that you would send your son to die for me. I can't comprehend it, but I choose to believe it. Because the word of God clearly says it. So this day, I take my stand. I put my feet on the word of God. I cling to the cross of Jesus Christ. The word says you love me. The word says that your son's blood is more than enough to cleanse someone like me. And I will believe that. And I will hold to that the rest of my life, to the last breath in my body. Jesus Christ, you are my Savior. 
You died for me. You're my propitiation. It was your blood sprinkled out before the Father that appeals for me. I believe it. And I will believe it for all eternity. This day, I am no longer an enemy. I'm a friend. In my heart, I love you. I surrender to you. I give you the rest of my life. How can I live it for myself when I see what you've done for me? Take me, change me, clean me, heal me. I want to live for you, Jesus. I want to serve you. I want my life to count for you. The rest of it belongs to you, my precious Lord. Fill me now. You promised the Holy Spirit that he would come into me, be shed abroad in my heart, that he would declare your love for me deep inside my soul. I welcome you, Holy Spirit, to speak loud, to dwell within, to tell me of the love of God, to counsel me and guide me, to strengthen me, to correct me. I love you. And I welcome you into my heart. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray these things. And I mean every word I say. Amen. If you prayed that, and, for the, and, and it was a, an important moment, a real decision you, were made, you made, I wish after service you'd stop by the Welcome Center and just say, I prayed with the pastor. I just did a brand new CD where I sit down and I just talk to you. I want to talk to you and tell you what you did and what it means and, and, and what the next steps would be. And so if you, it's all free. They'll just hand it to you. But just say, I prayed with the pastor today. And I want to, I want to give you that and some other materials. But please, in fact, if you've been saved recently and, and I got a new CD, I'd like, go listen to the new one. And I just want to talk to you. In that. And that brings us to the Lord's table. How appropriate. Jesus was so clear. It says, On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, gave it to his disciples. He said, Take eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Jesus was saying symbolically, Lay hold of me by faith. I'm about to die for you. And what I'm going to do, my broken body, is for you. Believe it. Receive it into your heart. And he took a cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And it's red, and it looks like blood, and it was meant to. It's Passover wine. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is the new covenant. Drink it and believe that I am giving you through my, my life shed for you. I'm bringing the promised new covenant. What a wonderful covenant that is. God says in that covenant, he says, I won't treat you like I did in the old covenant. It's a brand new one. He says, now I'm going to write my law on your mind and put it in your heart. In other words, I'll give you a revelation of my will, and I'll give you the want to. You'll have a new heart, a whole new attitude toward me. You'll love me now and want to obey me. And then he says, in this new covenant, he says, you'll all know me from the least to the greatest. Nobody's going to say to someone else, know the Lord. For every one of you in this new covenant will all know me. Why? I'll dwell inside of you. And then he says this, and I'll be merciful to you. And your sins I'll remember no more. The cup of the new covenant. Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it, all of you. Today, as we're taking communion, I can think of nothing better than to just allow the Holy Spirit to show you how much God loves you. I mean, we can confess all sorts of things, but right now, let's just say, Lord, I, I open my heart to that love, to this great sacrifice. Just show me spiritually. If you've forgotten his love, if you've grown dry inside and it's just you're living out your Christianity, but the love and the sense of his dear presence and compassion for you isn't there. 
Ask him right now as we take communion. Lord, just break through that crust. Break through the condemnation. Break through the junk. I got to feel your love. And let him do a deep work in us. May I have those come who will assist me in serving? You may go right ahead and take the trays. As we pass the trays to one another, we, we pass it to the next person and hold it while they take the bread and cup. And we say this, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Would you practice that? The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Imagine Jesus is serving us today. And, and through your brother or sister, he's handing you the tray. He's handing you the bread. He's handing you the cup. He's offering himself to you. Let him do that today. And then we'll take together in just a few minutes when everybody's been served. Who knew that he himself, through his son, would take on human flesh, endure all that he did, allow himself, as it were, to be raised up the propitiation for our sins that publicly his, his life poured out, the wrath falling on one man, his beloved son, so that he could rescue us. Such love, such a longing to rescue us from an eternity of justice. The just and the justifier and that one said to us, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As you're ready today to say, Jesus, I believe with all my heart. You are my propitiation. You died on the cross. Your body was broken and pierced for me. I receive it and I believe in it. Would you take the body of Christ broken for you? took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this in remembrance of me as you're ready now to say Lord I believe in that new covenant I receive the blessings of the new covenant I receive the Holy Spirit dwelling in me I'd receive that mercy and that you remember my sins no more I stand holding on to Christ and to the new covenant would you drink your cup Dear Jesus, how we love you and how you love us. Dear Father, such love that would send your Son to rescue us. We believe. We believe. We receive it. We simply shed all of the condemnation, all of the, 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 the recriminations and self-anger. We put it aside and we bury it right now. For we are loved with an everlasting love. And we stand in that love, strengthened, healed. We have an advocate at the right hand of the Father, appealing us before the Father constantly. How much are we saved by his life? Blessed be the resurrected Jesus. In your mighty name we pray it. And if that is your prayer, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Would you stand with me and pass your cups to the center aisles? I'll bless you in just a moment, but can I remind you that we have these little communion uh, kits. They're at the Welcome Center as well. well they're, a, they're a bit of juice, and there's something in the top that is edible and won't hurt you. And, and it's, it's likened to a wafer. Yes, and, but are there people at home who are sick, depressed, elderly, uh, in the hospitals, you know, maybe some elderly person down the street, just someone the Lord lays on your heart and you would be willing to take communion out of this room and to that person. You say, I don't know what I would say. Well, if you ask them, they'll just give you, there's even a sheet back there that just says, here's, what, here's how to serve communion. 
So you could just take one for you and one for the person and, and serve communion. Watch what happens. I mean, isn't it so powerful? I mean, nothing like communion brings us to the cross. Watch the depressed person. Watch the lonely person or the elderly person. Watch that person touch to the heart as they're reminded that Jesus loves them and what he did for them on the cross. It's so powerful. People need it. We mustn't forget those who can't come. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you all. Thank you so much for coming. He loves you with an everlasting love.